Tonight, we're back with John and Victoria Youngworth to check on the progress of our birch bark canoe project. And Kristen takes a look at stocking sturgeon. Thanks, Brian. Tonight on Discovering, I have a story on the efforts to restore the lake sturgeon population to the Ontonagon River. The fish were real healthy this year. They went in at about seven to nine inches in length. Sit back and relax. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Earlier this fall, I came across the Lake Sturgeon Rearing Trailer at the Berglund Dam on the northeast corner of Lake Ogibbic. I was excited to poke my head inside to see the hundreds of tiny fish because I had never seen a lake sturgeon before, and there's a reason why. Lake sturgeon are on the threatened species list in Michigan and in most other states where they occur, and the, the ultimate goal of the Michigan DNR and the federal agencies and tribal agencies that we're partnering with is to bring sturgeon abundance and distribution back to the point that we can take them off the threatened species list. Um, specifically in the Ontonagon River, there was historically a very large sturgeon population. Early accounts from European explorers of the region documented the, the abundance. Um, but the sturgeon were gone from the Ontonagon River as far as we could tell in the late 1980s and early 1990s. It was, it was over harvesting primarily that led to their initial decline, um, but Things like dam construction on rivers that they used for spawning certainly didn't help things. Um, a lot of water quality problems that have been rectified with you know, the Clean Water Act. A, a much greater uh, awareness of the value of healthy environments has given us the opportunity to now bring sturgeon back and other native species as well. Well, they're unique among the fish, native fish of the Great Lakes. Um, they're the largest fish by far that we, we have in the Great Lakes. They can be well over 200 pounds. They live a very long time. They can live to be over 100 years old. Another unique aspect of their reproductive ecology is that the females don't spawn every year. A female can spawn once every three to four years. Um, so they're, they're unusual in that regard. They're an ancient fish. They've been around since the age of the dinosaurs. Very little change evolutionarily speaking. Instead of scales, these freshwater giants have rows of bony plates on its sides and has cartilage like a shark. They are a bottom-dwelling fish with greenish-gray coloring and a pointed snout with two pairs of whisker-like organs called barbels to help it locate food. We started stocking lake sturgeon in the Ontonagon River way back in 1998 and it was a, a stocking opportunity that came to us basically when the Minnesota and Wisconsin DNRs came to us um, requesting eggs and fish for them to continue their stocking effort in the St. Louis River. Um, they were looking for a Lake Superior gamete source. And so uh, they, they knew we were working with sturgeon in the Sturgeon River in uh, Houghton and Berga counties and asked us if we would be willing to provide them with fish to stock the St. Louis. And we took that opportunity in 1998 to start stocking the Ontonagon River as well. We've been stocking, not annually, but most years since 1998 in the Ontonagon River in an attempt to try and restore a self-sustaining lake sturgeon population to the river. Well, because of their biology, sturgeon restoration is a long-term effort. It takes 20 plus years for females to reach sexual maturity. So the fish we started stocking back in 1998 are just now reaching the age of maturity and we're hoping we'll start to come back to the Ontonagon River and start spawning. We initially were raising the fish to stock in the Ontonagon River at our Wolf Lake Hatchery, which is down in southwestern Michigan. 
but as we learned more about lake sturgeon and their life history and their biology, we realized that we wanted to, to do all that we could to make sure the fish would come back to the Ontonagon River. Um, lake sturgeon are just like salmon and steelhead. They imprint to the river that they come from, or that the, the eggs hatch in essentially. So we decided we wanted to start raising sturgeon in the streamside facility where we could use river water to raise the fish where the fish were going to be stocked. My name is Henry Quinlan. I'm a fish biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at our Ashland Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office. We've been involved directly with this project since 2013 when we uh, were able to acquire the trailer. The trailer was purchased with Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding. The streamside rearing trailer concept really developed from our interest in conserving genetic uh, integrity in ensuring that fish imprint to the system in which they're stocked. We know that lake sturgeon return to their stream of origin. They have this homing instinct as salmon do. The effort here is to bring eggs from the sturgeon river onto the Ontonagon River system. We raise them up with flow through water from the west branch of the Ontonagon River here from essentially the first hours of, of fertilized eggs in an attempt to imprint them to the Ontonagon River. We do know that the streams around Lake Superior, the populations are unique. So part of this effort to raise them on, in a streamside facility is to limit the fish that we're stocking here from entering other populations and intermixing there in an unnatural situation. It's, it's a little bit of theory and a little bit of science, but we as fishery managers try to do the, the best job we can to uh, keep those genetic populations unique around, around the lake. Each spring when the water temperature uh, starts to reach about 50 degrees in the Sturgeon River, Ed Baker will, would put out the call to the fishery agencies that are involved with the project that it's time to gather and, and uh, attempt to capture Lake Sturgeon in the Sturgeon River. We literally walk up to them and, and dip net them and walk them to shore as is appropriate, scan them, look for uh, whether they've been a, a fish that's been used, because part of this project is to make sure that we have a a very diverse genetic uh, resource here. So we never reuse the same females. And so we scan them first. And then we, if they haven't been used then we, and they're ready to go, we can take a portion of that female's eggs. We never take all of them. And then we gather boyfriends for them. So we do like a five to one or four to one ratio, which mimics nature. So that we sure ensure that those 10 tanks in that trailer have a good mix of genetics, but then they're separated by female parentage in those tanks. We have 10 tanks inside. Our target is 1,500 fish from 10 different females each year. It's always a challenge. This particular spring, we were unable to get eggs from any females in the Sturgeon River because of the high water levels. And so we ended up actually catching wild larvae after the sturgeon and the Sturgeon River spawned and their young were drifting downstream. We set nets in the river to catch those larval sturgeon that were about an inch long at that time. Brought them here to the trailer and then it's a simple process for the rest of the summer. It's, it's pretty standard aquaculture practices. We have to be here every day to feed the fish. We clean the tanks, monitor their growth. Yeah, this is a weekly um, clean that we do. And then every day we do a flush of the tank with the fish still in the tank. Um, we drain the water down to about two inches deep um, and then give it a, a clean as best we can and then fill it back up with water. So that happens every day right before we feed. Today we are conducting our weekly batch weights at the trailer where we measure uh, the weight of the fish in an individual tank. 765.5. Because that also tells us how much feed we need to put into these guys. So right now we're feeding them about 55% of their body weight during the day feed and then a smaller amount at night. So each week we, we measure that weight in the tank and then calculate what our feed should be each day for the rest of the week. So the krill we're feeding at 10% of their body weight. A higher protein feed helps them grow better. And we also feed blood worm. And the blood worm is pretty much a, a natural feed for them. We used to do this on the counter in there so it's a little bit easier. I'm just trying to give those guys some room in there. So, pretty labor intensive, but I think the bang for our buck is gonna definitely be seen in a few years when we start getting spawning fish coming back. 
So We also do uh, an individual sample of 25 fish from each of our tanks to look at growth, length, four. and weight at the individual fish level. We do that from about middle of July Six, till the end three. of our stocking period to, to track growth and, and adjust our feed. Weight is 24.5. 15.4, 16 16.5, 182, 161. It's kind of fun seeing how much backing we're getting from the local community on doing this. We probably average about 120, 130 visitors a year. And a lot of them are repeat visitors where they'll come early June when we have small fish and they'll bring relatives. And then as people come up and visit, they'll keep on coming back and seeing the trailer and seeing the growth on the fish. And like I say, it's very, really neat seeing people come in and, and enjoying the trailer. We're also tagging some fish today and we're tagging with a pit tag, an individual unique mark. They're the same tags that veterinarians use in dogs and cats for long-term identification. So the pit tags that we're putting in these fish today when they're a few inches long will still be there when the fish are six feet long and, and it's 40 or 50 years from now. And we'll be able to tell Steve from Bob from Susie um, from this spring stock and we can identify individual fish using those pit tags. 189, 28.1. 3.7. Once the fish are tagged, we'll take them down to the river um, below all the dams and uh, just release them, send them on their way. We're stocking these fish that are being raised up here at the, at the Berglund Dam up on the west branch of the Ontonagon River. We'll transport these fish downstream below Victoria Dam and near the military uh, bridge crossing on Highway 45 and stock them in, in the Ontonagon River at, that, at those locations. Uh, the purpose of that is that this is, effort is to restore Lake Sturgeon to the Ontonagon River that has access to Lake Superior. So today we are releasing about 1,100 uh, Lake Sturgeon that were born in May. Uh, they've been sitting in the Berglund uh, rearing trailer for the last four or five months here. And it's been a great success. Uh, we've produced more sturgeon than we uh, initially hoped for, and so we were able to uh, get a full stocking of fish this year, which was great. Uh, we're sitting here at the junction of the East Branch and uh, main stem of the Ontonagon River. The main reason we're releasing them here is, uh, one, they're, they're imprinted on Ontonagon River system water, and two, uh, the water temperature here is perfect today for uh, releasing Lake Sturgeon, and they have a, a straight shot out to Lake Superior. Some will remain in the river for a year or two. Others will move out into Lake Superior. The shoreline waters fairly quickly. And then at some point when they, uh, when they mature, they'll return up to the Ontonagon River to spawn. The 2019 year class has, has been stocked into the river and we're, we're pretty excited about, about that. The fish uh, were real healthy this year. They went in at about seven to nine inches in length. So we stocked out 1,507. Our target is 1,500, so we're, we're right on target. You mentioned that this really is a process that could not go on without all of the partners that are involved in this effort. The Fish and Wildlife Service stepped up and, and purchased the trailer. We've uh, partnered with Michigan DNR, uh, the Ottawa National Forest, uh, Fond du Lac, uh, Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, and had some support from uh, UPCO, obviously, for placement of the trailer here, and the USGS uh, Water Resources Division to provide some temperature data for our trailer. So there's a couple of other associated projects that, that we're, we're doing now to uh, to get a full, complete picture of, of our stocking effort here in, in the Ontonagon River system. Um, the fact that we're seeing some adults entering the river is, is exciting, of course, and, and our ultimate goal. Uh, and I guess the next step, once we start to 
identify where they're spawning would be to start uh, putting larval drift nets out to see if we're catching any any uh, eggs that are hatching from those those stocked fish. So there's a probably another 10 years of assessment there that will be done as as these fish mature and, and begin to spawn in the Ontonagon River. Bring the ribs in. They've been out here for a few days. Let's see, 53, 54 ribs. I always make a few spares of each size. Okay, we need to find the 50 best ribs out of this pile. Each rib has a perfect spot where it'll be best suited, like where a knot is. Maybe you don't want the bend to be there, or it's a little skinnier, so we'll put it towards the end. I like the wide ones, the wide fat ones in the middle. It's kind of like building a log house or something. Every log in the pile has a perfect place in the house. And it's up to you to figure out which one. Now we gotta find the perfect rib to do the end here. That's a pretty tight bend. We're gonna mark these where this cross is here. And then it comes right down to here. The last rib's gonna sit right there. So that's gotta be made out of spaghetti. But the grain tells you a lot. Wide grain will take the bend, but it'll be a weaker, softer wood, but down here it doesn't matter. In tight grain, we'll make a nice harder wood, make a stronger rib. Let's try that one there. Okay, and if you think about when you use a canoe, where do you step in? Where's the human foot? That's the big danger. Where's, where's that gonna put the weight down? So there's the place here where the people sit at each end, and then in the middle, so that's why I like the widest ribs in through there to try to cover most, most of the bottom of the boat and then they can be skinny at the very ends because it doesn't matter. The ribs don't have to work for a living down there. Then I'm going to mark that edge on all of these. And each rib, the, the part of the rib that you see here, these are the bottoms of the ribs and that's the inside of the tree. The wood loves to bend away from the, the center. You see boards warp. The outside of the tree is like the inside of the letter C when it warps. Now we're gonna be using tons of hot water to soften up all of the, I don't know, lignins or glues in the wood and do the bending when, when we're satisfied, then we'll, we'll lock it in place with some string. Since I like the middle of my boats to be fat a lot at the water line, I'll probably bend it a little bit outside of the line. And then as we get towards the ends, I'll bend it a little bit further on the inside because I like a narrow entry on the, on the boat shape. But the bark will have its own ideas, so that's really what counts. And of course you have to have coffee cans to do anything if you want to be in the woods. I got one of these in the sauna too. The wood will tell you when it's time to bend because if it's not time, it won't bend and you'll break and then you'll have to go get, go get your spare. See, and every piece of wood's got its own idea. There'll be oh, there's a little thing there, but the bark will force the issue. The ribs don't get to tell the bark what to do. It's the other way around. I just look for symmetry. Bend all the ribs and then dry them out behind the stove. And I always put a little extra, a little bit more bend in it. We start it in the middle. We start on one side, do a pair, and then we'll go to the other side, do a pair, and we'll keep doing that. So we'll end up with two bundles of then ribs in the end. And mostly we, you want the hot water to go on the bottom side because that's the part that has to stretch. We'll end up with a little round to the bottom of the boat, but that's, uh, that's traditional too. Makes it better handling craft. Nothing's gotta be perfect though, because like I say, the bark's gonna have the final word when you pound these into place. So we'll keep adding them in and eventually this, these will both fill up until the last ones that go in will be a little V-shaped one up in here. And then we'll put them behind the stove, let them dry out. And uh, next week I'll put them in. A couple of things to watch for. The Mid-UP chapter of the Rough Grow Society will be holding their annual Conservation and Sportsman's Banquet on Saturday, January 18th at the NMU University Center in Marquette. For info, email them at roughgrossup at gmail.com.
and of interest to folks in Delta County. At the January 14th County Board Meeting, a resolution will be proposed for making Delta a sanctuary county for the purpose of protecting our Second Amendment right to bear arms. The meeting will be held at 515 at the Delta County Service Center Boardroom in Escanaba. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering.